This week on BSD Now, we have the Project Trident 18.12 release. We cover the Spotify D on NetBSD. OpenSense 18.7.10 is available. And we have an uh, epic AMD-powered Sun Ultra 24 workstation, as well as developments in OpenRSync and LLD porting to NetBSD in this week's episode of BSD Now. BSD Now, episode 282, Open the R-Sync, recorded on the 23rd of January, 2019. Hello, I'm your host, Benedict Reuschling. And I'm Alan Jude. And we have great headlines for you this week. It's finally here, the Asia BSDCon 2019 call for papers. Yes, uh, so Asia BSDCon is the uh, BSD technical conference in Asia, held every year, uh, and it will be in... I said March, uh, whoops, what did I lose here? Uh, March 21st to 24th uh, in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, so if you have done interesting work uh, on a BSD-based system, like you know uh, FreeBSD, NetBSD, OpenBSD, Dragonfly, Darwin, or OS X, uh, then please come submit a paper. Yes. Uh, the submission That's... deadline is January 30th, so you only have about a week, so you want to get on top of that. Um, but um, we will notify the submissions that are chosen uh, by f- hopefully February 4th, uh, and then the deadline for the final submission of all your materials is February 25th, since your paper uh, and tutorial materials need to be printed up uh, and ready since... The conference includes a printed proceedings, which is actually very helpful. Yeah, because if you miss a talk, then you can still browse through the proceedings on your way back. Yes, Uh, and it also is very helpful for members of the audience and so on uh, when they don't have English as a first language to be able to read at a slower pace. Uh, And generally, you know, the paper has more detail than you can fit in a 45 to 50 minute talk. Yeah, or you could also submit a tutorial because they also Mm -hmm. have tutorial tracks uh two days of tutorials and two days of talks and if you are the teaching type then a tutorial might be something that people are interested in yep so um write up your submission and send it to secretary at asiabsdcon.org um there's a outline here of what you should include You know, the name, the, the title. The, the paper <laughs> title, uh, the abstract, the names of the authors of the paper, um, the name of the speaker. Um, there's only one, the conference only pays for one speaker, but if you have multiple, that's fine, but they're only going to pay for one of them. Anyway, uh, the name of the speaker, and if they need a visa to get in Japan, uh, you indicate that, and they will add an invitation letter, try to make that easier, uh, and an estimate of your travel expenses so that they can... Uh, look at paying for your flight uh, and they will arrange the hotel uh, and your email address so they can let you know. Yeah, that would be great. Go to Japan. It's it's amazing. Mm-hmm. And of course, we'll be there as, 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 along the other attendees. Um, mm-hmm. There's a favorite uh, a place around uh, town where also people uh, can have uh, dinner and drinks and um, it's a good chance to see some cool Asian hardware that you normally not don't see. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, Tokyo is a, is a very yummy city. You should definitely come. Uh, and it seems quite certain that Asia BSD Con will be in Taipei next year. So this is your last chance to come to Tokyo for a while. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all good reasons, and uh, yeah, so stop what you're doing, stop this episode, start writing and submit the tutorial, and then continue with this episode. Yep. Okay. Yes, please get those abstracts in as soon as possible. As you see, there's a very short window for us to review the papers, so the sooner you get yours in, the easier it is for us to uh, start reading it over. Yeah, that helps everyone. Yes. Submitting early gives you a higher chance of being accepted. Oh, um, 
I'm off. Uh, <laughs> I haven't done my submission yet, but it's uh, it's it's mm-hmm. going to be finished soon. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, but in other news, we have a Project Trident release. 18.12 is out. Woohoo! Yeah. So, uh, they have, of course, release notes and uh, on the website, project-trident.org. And I think the release uh, has happened a couple of days ago. Let's see. Uh, oh, that's the 15th of January. Yeah. Okay. So after um, last week's episode, yeah. So <laughs> barely made it in the last ones, uh, but now we have it in the headlines for this week. And so this version is based off the eighteen point twelve stable branch of TrueOS. So three BSD thirteen current, if you want to have it this way, uh, mm-hmm. using the new TrueOS distribution framework with several add-ons by Project Trident itself. The packages with this release were created from the TrueOS ports tree as of January seventh. And they're planning to release regular updates to packages every week or two, depending on the state of the port tree at that given time. And in this release, uh, both the Chromium and Iridium browsers also have been fixed and function normally again. Okay. Then they have... Um, oh, so the 18.12 release has been a long time in development. And uh, they wish to say a big uh, thank you to everyone who has been helping out uh, with testing and the of the pre-release versions, uh, finding issues, and who submitted also fixes both uh, to them and to upstream FreeBSD TrueOS projects, and in general being wonderful and supportive community. Oh, great. And they look forward to continuing to work with uh, all of the people out there in making Project Trident amazing. So, yep. And they actually have uh, 18.12 update 1 available already. Ah, okay. Nothing. Um, which like mostly looks like uh, a fix for the system updating tool and the newer versions of Chrome and Firefox. They bought oh. Chromium from 68 to 71 and uh, updated Firefox for security fixes and so on. Okay. So there's a long list of new packages. You might want to scroll this uh, down a little bit. This might take mm-hmm. some time. Um, they have a warning at the beginning. So the Persona Crypt uh, utility Persona is unavailable. Crypt. A personal crypt, yeah. Uh, this is unavailable in this version of Project Trident. If you have your home directory on a personal crypt USB drive, then they strongly recommend migrating your data back to the local drive before doing any updates. So um, that's important to know. And the rest, uh, after you scroll down, um, <laughs> all the list of package versions, uh, you see everything um, that you might want to have if you want to get updates about project trident by the way they have a twitter account uh this is uh of course trident project and there you can get the latest news about project developments uh testing versions and other news you might be interested in uh, they also have screenshots on twitter or uh, post that on the channel so that you can see how it might look like if you install it of course you can do a lot of customization starting from the wallpaper back to uh the icons and uh, what else is new? Oh, they also have a Telegram channel. Uh, there's the Project Trident Community Telegram channel for asking questions, um, having a couple of people who are also using the operating system around to, um, you know, maybe sharing wallpapers or just uh, get into the Trident groove. Uh, there also is uh, some mention of it already on DistroWatch. Uh, we have that linked in the show notes so that uh, mm-hmm. you can get to that one yes and our uh, kind of little brother podcast uh the linux action news uh did a review of it as well oh yes okay so it's already making the rounds that's good so it seems popular and there's also uh, a youtube video about from robo nuggies in depth review about it uh, so yeah definitely check it out uh maybe install it um in a virtual machine and try it out there and if you like it then Go ahead with your main machine and, yeah, tell us something about it, how you like it, and give feedback to the people who are doing it. And that's enormously helpful to get the next version even better than the current one. Okay, uh, so that's the Trident uh, update. And what we also have is uh, something for the audio people out there. I guess that's pretty much everyone uh, Mm -hmm. because we have some... (laughs) <laughs> everyone except Alan everyone okay. is listening to Spotify D uh, but now it's also possible to do that on NetBSD yes uh, I remember hacking on Spotify 
for Gavin at I, uh, BSD Cam like three or four years ago now. Like my my second BSD Cam many years ago. Um, and barely getting it working. Uh, or not actually getting it quite working, but anyway. Uh, so they start with their kind of irrelevant preamble, uh, talking about how they were weighing if they should subscribe for Spotify or Apple Music. And they went with Spotify owing to being cross-platform and I have a NetBSD desktop uh, and would like that to actually work. Uh, and apparently they could use it with the now defunct Flash Base player and it was good. Then the Flash player went away uh, and they started using Widevine, which doesn't work on BSD. So I was out of luck on NetBSD, even tried a few things like running the Linux client using the Linux compatibility. But uh, they weren't even aware of Spotify Connect clients, but stumbled across uh, RA Spotify, which led me to LibRespot, which led me to SpotifyD. Uh, so these are the steps I went through to build and run SpotifyD uh, on NetBSD. So it's a Spotify Connect client, so it means I uh, still need to control Spotify from another device, like my phone, but the audio is played through the machine running Spotify D, uh, which is where the speakers or headphones are plugged in. It means I don't have to unplug stuff and replug it into my phone or anything like that. So okay. it's 100% good enough for what I need. Uh, mm, yeah. And they say they've also had a quick play with the Go-based microcontroller for spot control. Uh, and trying to get to a NetBSD only experience, but that's kind of a more advanced one for a future time or something. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so they installed Rust via package source or package in, uh, clone the Spotify D repo, build it with the cargo command. Um, so that'll take some time to do some compiling. Uh, and that talks about a couple of patches it needed for things like demonize and get interface addresses. Uh, so we've got that all building, and you can also you know make your firewall let it happen. <laughs> so they have a NPF examples here, uh, and then they create the Spotify D.conf, get it running, and uh, launch it at startup. They haven't actually created a Spotify D uh, RC D script yet, but easy enough to do. And with that, uh, now you can find uh, a fork on their GitHub on how to list some of the patches and so on. Uh, they also say, but it isn't needed uh, if you have the pulse audio no default features thing, whatever that is. <laughs> uh, but it sounds like uh, this should work on most of the other BSDs too. They say, uh, if you look at the tweaks I've made, you'll see that uh, they're all very similar and pretty much copying changes someone already made for OpenBSD. That means it really should be trivial to make this work on OpenBSD and uh, FreeBSD. As a rough guide, looking through Rust stuff, it could be, uh, there are nearly always FreeBSD fixes and quite often OpenBSD fixes, but rarely NetBSD fixes. Mm -hmm. But in theory, it could be used on the other BSDs. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> basically what they're saying is that if you look at the changes they made for NetBSD, they're probably about the same. Okay, yeah, so we can probably enjoy Spotify uh, on all the other BSDs as well. Because I, I remember people uh, have been saying it that it's supposed to be unportable, but uh, apparently it's not, so... Which is that? Uh, the Spotify daemon. Ah, this, I this particular what? Spotify ID, I think, is not meant to be unportable or anything. Mm. Yeah, they want to have more uh, people using it. So, well, it's it was written in Rust <laughs> as a replacement. So, mm. yeah, <laughs> that makes it more easy to get over to other platforms. Yep. And remember, with NetBSD, your toaster could, in the future, maybe play the Spotify. <laughs> there you go. Your toaster could play a song to uh, to notify you when your toast is ready. Yeah, so NetBSD, if you have something on NetBSD, it opens up a whole lot of uh, other architectures and markets you never knew you would. I don't know <laughs> what Rust support for different architectures is actually like. That's a hmm. one thing I haven't looked at in Rust. Yeah, so hmm, 
from the from the mainframe to the smallest uh, embedded device it could play Spotify. <laughs> Oh, time for news roundup this week. Uh, we have OpenSense uh, release 18.7.10 being out. So um, the new or the release notes start with Happy New Year, everyone. So that's still valid. And uh, 2019 means 19.1 is almost here. But in the meantime, they accept this small incremental update with goodies such as Suricata 4.1, custom passwords for P12 certificate export, as well as fresh fixes in the FreeBSD base. So... Who doesn't want that? Uh, a lot of cleanups went into this update, they write, to make sure that there would be a smooth transition to 19.1 RC for this uh, for the early birds there. And they expect RC1 in one to two weeks uh, and the final 19.1 on January 19, 29. That's next week. Oh, cool. More news for us then. <laughs> okay, so they have a full list of patch notes. Uh, starting from uh, base system updates to interfaces as well as firewall uh, changes and f updates there. Um, and that's a lot of good stuff, I think, for an update that's definitely worthwhile um, putting onto your OpenSense appliance or whatever system it's running on. Very nice. Uh, so the next story here is uh, quite an interesting one. Uh, this is um, over at Serve the Home. Uh, it says, a few, a few weeks ago, I got the itch to build a high-end workstation with an AMD Epic CPU. There were a few constraints, though. First, I wanted a higher clock speed part. And second, I wanted the whole build to be focused on being an ultra-high-end workstation rather than using like gaming components. Um, and with that, I decided it was time to make it interesting as well. And so with a bit of nostalgia, uh, so I decided I wanted to do an homage to the Sun Microsystems workstations. And Sun made the server gear that the industry ran on for years. And as a fun fact, if you go behind the one hacker way sign at Facebook's campus, they left the old Sun Microsystems logo. So what he did was find an old um, uh, Sun Ultra 24, um, but got somehow got lucky enough to find an unopened one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so this is uh, uh, the basically one of the last models of workstation that Sun produced uh, before they got bought by Oracle in uh, like 2010. Um, so it's actually... Uh, at the time, most of the um, Sun Ultra workstations were built on AMD Optron CPUs, if you got the, the AMD 64 one. Although this particular one is also interesting because it's a Core 2 Duo CPU instead. So it's an mm -hmm. Intel. Um, but the marketing material that comes with it, it still says AMD. <laughs> <laughs> so like, Oops. there's a, a letter when you open the box from the... Uh, like the head of but, uh, systems group uh, saying, you know, these x86 or x64 systems based on AMD Optron or whatever, when it's actually a Core 2 Duo E8600 in the box. <laughs> but yes, so in a barn somewhere, he managed to find one of these um, Sun Ultra 24 workstations with an old Core 2 Duo in it and then gut it and build uh, an AMD Epic in it. But this way it looks like an old-fashioned Sun Ultra 24 Super Workstation. Yeah, with a lot more horsepower under the belly. Mm -hmm. I remember them being very loud. So we oh, had some a workstation, the... not a server, but I, it was possible I didn't actually ever use it anything sun like that we had some in the in the um computer aided software mm -hmm. engineering lab and they they switched it to to newer ones by now but i had an old one for a while and was it, maybe that one was a little bit loud because the cpu cooler wasn't working very well but mm -hmm. i remember it's just turning it on would like raise the first the temperature and also the decibel levels in the office yeah. significantly 
So taking a quick look at the specs of the donor system, uh, from which is about 12 years old uh, now, I guess. Uh, it had an Intel X38 Express chipset, uh, a dual core 3.33 gigahertz uh, Core 2 Duo, uh, a DVD burner, uh, four gigs of RAM as four one gig sticks, <laughs> a 250 gigabyte spinning hard drive, and uh, an NVIDIA Quadro uh, FX 1700 graphics card, and onboard one gigabit ethernet. Uh, two X16 slots, two legacy PCI slots, and uh, a PCI X8 slot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Express X1 slot and uh, dual DVI output and so on. So ah. <laughs> mostly gutting that and uh, cabling up the new stuff. Although they do know interesting things. I remember seeing this on their Twitter. Back in the day, what Sun did was color code each of the different SATA connectors. Right, There's red, green, blue, black, white, etc. So that you could tell which one was which. Uh, and if you look at a gaming board motherboard nowadays, there's lots of colors, but they don't actually mean anything. They're usually just blinking lights and so on. And showing off some of the toolless design of the case, which is very nice. Comparing mm-hmm. the graphics card to a modern one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a difference. <laughs> yeah, and they walk through how they built the system and how they selected the CPU, an Epic 3771. Uh, a Gigabyte MZ01 CEO motherboard. Mm-hmm. A thousand watt power supply. <laughs> and a RTX 2080 Ti. Oh yeah, that's certainly for the nostalgics. <laughs> but yeah, this and used a, to be... An Optane what? 905P 380 gig M2 SSD. Um, somehow I think that's going to beat the pants off the 250 gig spinning drive that was in the system originally. <laughs> I guess so, yeah. But this used to be the state of the art. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, a Broadcom SAS 3 HVA and a Micron 3.2 terabyte uh, SAS 3 SSD. Yeah, a, a 9340-8i. Fancy. And... Uh, 256 gigs of RAM instead of four. <laughs> and uh, Mellanox 100 gigabit network card. Uh-huh. And uh, one of the front bays is filled with USB 3 port uh, headers. So you can connect all the USB 3. Mm-hmm. Okay. So this is what it looks like once it's all filled out, which is, you know, a little bit fancier. I do like the <laughs> hot swap bays that are inside the case. Yeah, that should be industry standard by now. <laughs> uh, comparing the motherboards, they're about the same size, but uh, they pack quite a bit more into the new one. Yeah, I remember this thing being very heavy, not the thing you would drag around easily. All right, comparing the stock hard drive to the NVMe drive... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a difference. <laughs> yeah. And they got it all wired up. So are they having it uh, in use for something or is it just a building? I'm sure they will. I don't know project. if they have anything about that posted yet, but I'm sure we'll see that over time. Yeah. You so know, They just built the thing. Give them some time before they're running benchmarks on it or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're back again with the Ultra 24 workstation, beating yeah. everyone's <laughs> other benchmarks. And it sounds like they might have had to change the CPU cooler a little bit to make it run the other way so that the video card doesn't run into it. Hmm. And then they have, ooh, they have a fancy diagram here showing how the air flows work. Yeah, that was and sophisticated. How they, try to cool the hard drives since uh, that can be a problem nowadays, especially with uh, 3.2 terabyte flash devices. You can get pretty hot. Yeah. See, yeah, we're looks, solving uh, the problems all over again. Looks pretty crazy. Uh, I guess he notes that the uh, 
Sun Ultra 24 and Ultra 27 systems can be had for about $100 now. Uh, that's about the same cost as any ATX case, and you get all these free parts with it too. <laughs> the cable management is not so good. On the other hand, you know, it just works. Uh, that's pretty nice. If you yeah. have the space, that's uh, a pretty decent case, although it's awfully heavy, but that's kind of a better thing. Yeah. But yeah, good to know that old hardware can be still useful for something, at least a little bit of upgrades with newer hardware. Yep. So next up, our kind of, I guess, title uh, news item. Yeah, this is uh, interesting developments. We, I didn't know that something was in, uh, happening in this area. It's uh, our, all very new at this point. Uh, so Kristaps uh, of uh, other BSD uh, fame, mm -hmm. like uh, Mandoc, for example, has written, apparently, an open rsync client. Yes, well, it is is writing, I think, is the right way to put it. Not done yet, yeah, obviously. Still but, uh, a clean room re-implementation of rsync uh, with a BSD ISC license instead of, I think rsync is GPL. Um, or worse, is it weird? I don't remember. Uh, anyway, we could the out. license on the current version of rsync keeps it from being included as a base utility in the BSDs. But it is super useful, so it would be nice if there was a BSD version of rsync. Plus, uh, rsync is rather old and is kind of glommed together. Uh, it probably could do with a good fresh implementation and cleaning up. Hmm. Um, so the Goal is to be compatible with modern rsync. Uh, they're using version 3.1.3 as the starting point for their testing. Uh, currently, it's only designed to compile and run on OpenBSD, uh, but porting should, uh, from that should be relatively straightforward. Uh, it says this project is very new and very fast moving, so uh, you know it's not recommended that you really be trying to use it yet. Yeah, uh, it's not I ready for widespread a testing. Uh, or even very narrow testing. Uh, <laughs> it's not ready for strong attention and really any attention. Uh, it's just for careful programming at this point. Uh, but uh, he says, many people have asked about portability. Currently, the system is moving a bit too fast for porting right now, but he was able to copy the uh, configure script and the config to h uh, mask out some of the OpenBSD-specific functions, and get it to work on Linux and FreeBSD without any problems. Uh, the actual problem, however, is that a bunch of the security in it comes from Pledgen on Veil, and uh, while that's possibly could be done with Capsicum on FreeBSD, uh, on Linux it would just be a mess. Um, but there's an rsync and rsyncd man page uh, for protocol details, uh, and then eventually the open rsync man page will have the actual like user interface utility uh, documentation. Okay. And I had a look at the repo is a read only mirror of a private repo. So um, it uses it for issues and pull requests, but uh, don't make feature requests at this time. They're still trying to get the basic functionality working. Yeah, that's too early. I had a look at the original rsync page. So the last version is from 20, January 28, 2018. So almost a year old. And uh, the version before that was uh, uh, oh from December twenty first, twenty fifteen. Well, it, well, it's stable enough, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, a little f upgrades here and there could not uh, couldn't hurt. So probably an open rsync might draw a couple of people uh, interested in that uh, to help out. And of course, once it's uh, stable, we'll give it a, a try. Of course, we want to see how it works. Mm -hmm. It's uh, be interesting to look at a couple of bits. I see removing some MD5, but it does look like there's still some MD4. Of course, for compatibility, we can't just uh, replace that stuff. Uh, and yeah. you know, it, it's mostly just for comparing the files. I think that is what they use the MD4 for, not for uh, security or anything. It's just is this file the same as that file? Mm -hmm. I can also imagine Kristaps giving a talk about this at a conference in the near yes. future. He generally tends to be at Tokyo, so. Yeah. Or BSD can that might be mm -hmm. uh, a time frame that uh, should. Although BSD can doable. 
is closed now. I know, I know, but uh, yeah, uh, we'll see how it goes, and uh, we'll give you information when we have something that's exciting and uh, useful. Uh, but we don't spare with news this week. We also have something from NetBSD again. Uh, mm -hmm. The first report of LLD porting. So remember, we covered a couple of times um, their efforts of uh, LLVM porting, and they didn't stop there, apparently, because we mm -hmm. have an update on the NetBSD blog, and that's uh, posted by Kamil Rutarovsky and has the information that the LLD is the link editor, the linker component of the Clang toolchain, and its main advantage over the GNU LD is a much lower memory footprint and linking speed. Uh, it is a specific interest to those people who, or him, uh, <laughs> since currently 8 gigabytes of memory are insufficient to link LLVM statically, which is the upstream default. Uh, so the first goal of LLD porting is to ensure that LLD can produce working NetBSD executables and, be, and can be used to build LLVM itself. Then it's desirable to look into trying to build additional NetBSD components and eventually into replacing user bin LD entirely with LLD, like FreeBSD did recently, or fairly recently. Uh, so in this report they give here, they would like to shortly summarize the issues they have found so far trying to use LLD on NetBSD. So the first one is, uh, oh, that's a lot of text, but um, we'll just browse through. Uh, DT underscore R path versus DT T underscore run path. So our path is used to embed a library search path in the executable. Since it takes precedence over default system library path, it can be used both to specify the location of additional program libraries and to override system libraries. So on NetBSD, uh, DT underscore R path does not take precedence over LD library path. So therefore, there wasn't ever a need for DT run path and uh, the support for it. So that needed to be uh, addressed. Yeah. Uh, there's anyway, also it'd be interesting yeah. to see them migrating to being able to link uh, with LLD like FreeBSD does. Mm -hmm. And they probably will provide us with further updates uh, once they get um, that working. But yes, uh, you know, it needs to get to the point where you actually get working executables before you really want to do anything with it. Yeah, I remember the effort took uh, also a significant amount of time for FreeBSD folks to get yep. that working. Uh, hopefully some of that work has, will make the NetBSD work easier. Just yeah, like, probably. Uh, their work on sanitizers, we hope, will make it easier to have those on FreeBSD. Yeah, and most, uh, pretty much all of the issues that they find are they're trying to upstream those to the LLD or LLVM project so that they know about the BSDs are mm -hmm. uh, special in certain ways. Yes, and uh, a number of BSD people have commit bits up there and so on. It's they do a good job of paying attention to us. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's so next exciting. we have uh, ringing in the new uh, a blog post uh, by Adrian. I forget his last name. Uh, that does KDE for FreeBSD. Ah yes, yeah, uh, the Grot. Yes, that's it. Or something. Yeah. Um, so it's the second week of 2019 already, which means I'm curious what everybody's been going on. Uh, but looking at it, um, big ticket items for KDE on FreeBSD. Um, KDE Plasma has been updated to 5.14.5. The KDE Applications Bundle has been updated to 18.12.1, uh, which was released the same day. <laughs> uh, so we're right on top of that. Um, Marble, whatever that is, has been fixed uh, for FreeBSD running on Power 9. Oh, I didn't know people were running like KDE on Power 9. That's fancy. Uh, MuseScore uh, caught up to 18 months of releases, so that's modern again. And uh, Phonon has been updated to 4.10.1, along with all of its backends. Uh, and currently in development in the Area 51 repo uh, is Qt Web Engine 5.12. Uh, for the incongruously named Plasma 5.13 branch. <laughs> but it contains all the latest bits described above as well. So we will expect to see more KDE and Qt goodness in the FreeBSD port tree soon. Yeah, great. Yeah, all these efforts to port KDE uh, are, are huge because I know a lot of people are using KDE and want to have the latest versions available. 
Yep. So, uh, time for our big list of Beastie Bits this week. Uh, we have first uh, Nomad BSD 1.2 Release Candidate 1 being out. So, yes, that's great. Uh, so, this is a, a live system uh, spin of FreeBSD. Uh, they've, so, they've updated the base system. Uh, although, 11.2 RC3 seems like an old version. <laughs> ah, that's uh, just randomly I'm scrolled down for no reason. Okay. Here's the new version. There you go. Uh, so that's based on uh, FreeBSD 12 release. There we go. Good. Uh, that's the right one. Uh, but the setup menu has been improved. Uh, scripts for detecting and loading the Intel video driver are better. The user interface is uh, nicer. And the support for local keyboard maps uh, for entering your Geli password has been added, which can be important if you uh, type your password in not US English. Um, yeah. The swap partition has been removed and Linux base is not installed by default. But yeah, it's very handy if you want a live BSD system uh, to just plug into a computer and use. Uh, which can be super helpful if you want to do things like test BSD on a laptop at a store before you actually buy it. You know, many stores have displays where you can try out the laptop or whatever. If you can boot it off your USB stick and uh, make sure that all this functionality you want works under BSD, then you'll know, all right, that's the laptop I want. It's also used as a rescue system or even just uh, if you want a, a system where you're not going to leave anything behind when you reboot. Mm, sure. And the next item is from our very own JT, uh, making links between interesting uh, concepts. So uh, he uh, proposes that ZFS is the first enterprise blockchain. And he lists uh, two facts. The fact one is the blocks of a ZFS storage pool form a Merkle tree. Merkle tree? Yeah. Hmm? I have to be careful with our chancellor's name, but yeah. <laughs> so fact two is that a blockchain is a Merkle tree, and that combined basically means ZFS was the world's first and only enterprise blockchain product. Uh, I guess people can... Oh, there are a couple of comments already about this, and if people want to comment on that further, then post replies or send something uh, to us at feedback at bstnow.tv and we'll maybe add a show segment about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure you can quite jump to that conclusion, but sure. We we can discuss it. Yeah, there are some pros and cons to that. I think it's mm -hmm. not a complete chain because you cannot go back to the very first one because the checks are well, the overwritten. Very, well, no, because the very top one is the 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 MOS, the meta object set, right? And then, so you have your array of uber blocks yeah and the newest one will point to the top of a correct tree that you'll be able to go all the way down or up on ah so, but how i understand the blockchains is that you can really track everything back to the very very first thing and zfs right. these transactions get uh, well, recycled right, for, with, with zfs the system was represented by such a chain yeah that too yeah that's but it, we then throw that chain away and make a different chain Every time you change something, mm. yeah. So yes, the, with the blockchain, the point is you can't go back and change something. So uh. with, with ZFS, it's just we make a new blockchain that represents the the current system. Mm. It just yes, it's it's inf it's a different way of doing it, but it's still the same computer yeah. science concept. So ZFS did blockchains before it was cool. That's basically <laughs> right. what it also did it well before anybody else. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's just if move instead on of and... wasting electricity mining coins, you would like to save some battery life on your laptop, uh, then <laughs> yeah. check out Power Save for Dragonfly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a blog post uh, they have on the Dragonfly BSD uh, page, and it says that uh, there are some hints to make Dragonfly laptops suck less power and therefore run longer and cooler. 
Uh, so they talk a little bit about CPU C states and how to make uh, SysCTL adjustments to have those, as well as uh, frequency scaling, uh, backlight uh, changes so that it doesn't uh, draw too much power there, network interfaces downing, so those who are not in use could draw less power by just being switched off, and disabling unused devices, which should save a couple of watts, 0.2 and 0.3, uh, AHCI changes, so there's a couple of SysCTLs you can twiddle, and maybe that will save you um, the time to get to the next power outlet. Uh, also, we have NetBSD reaching 100% reproducible builds. That's mm -hmm. interesting and important, uh, since NetBSD uh, has a lot of architectures, and that will be interesting to have in a pro uh, reproducible way. Uh, so what reproducible builds are, they enable anyone to reproduce bit by bit identical binary packages from a given source so that anyone can verify that a given binary derived from the source, it was said to be derived. So there are no like timestamps in there or identifying information that this one computer has, but the other didn't that uh, build the, the binary. So reproducible builds mean you can be sure that the binaries will be exactly the same in size and in uh, their functionality or in their look and feel like the ones uh, they put out uh, originally from the NetBSD project. And you can find a couple of uh, build instructions uh, that you can see how to how that changes or what needs to be uh, adjusted. And yeah, that's pretty much the reproducible NetBSD. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> for some reason, the FreeBSD page over at reproduciblebuilds.org is broken and says there are zero files. Uh, not sure what happened there. Uh, talked to Ed a little bit about it. Apparently, the user lane in FreeBSD has been reproducible for quite a while, uh, other than the odd time when a bug gets introduced. I think um, some changes that happened recently in the PMC stat stuff uh, get sorted in a random order and so aren't always the same, but they're working on solving that. Um, I don't know how reproducible the kernel stuff is, although I do know in... Uh, head, they change some of the stuff so that we don't embed the revision and stuff into the kernel um, if you've not modified the source code at all, so that is reproducible. But if you do make changes, then it automatically turns that off so that you don't have to just run with it always off and so on. Um, but interesting to follow. Yeah, so definitely buildable and reproducibility is uh, good to have. Uh, we also have uh, this uh, uh, interface here. Well, this is uh, somebody posted a question to the FreeBSD subreddit asking, uh, hey, I'm working on a web interface to manage Beehive because I can find something similar to that. If you're interested, check it out. Uh, and people have also pointed out uh, CloneOS or whatever, CloneOS, mm. um, which is the other one that I've seen of this type. Um, I don't know how far along this one is they ah, they haven't actually uploaded it to github so we can't look at it so i don't know hmm. okay but the idea is good to uh to think about and maybe someone else mm -hmm. can have something to like graphically manage your or just view your mm -hmm. uh beehives that keep growing and growing uh okay yeah so but we also have gdx proof of concept on openbsd Yes. Um, so this, there's a Reddit post and a video, but it uh, seems to be getting this graphic stuff working on OpenBSD, and they're playing a game of uh, some kind. Uh, yeah, looks a little bit like, like Street Fighter. Yeah, but there's cards, so I think it's a slightly more role-playing game. Ah, Say the Spire, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, we look forward to more that in that area. Uh, you know, games are good. <laughs> yeah, and probably the, the YouTube video can can tell us more. Well, the YouTube video is three hours, so I didn't watch the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just uh, to get the excitement going. Uh, but also, we have Light CLI is a user-friendly command line client for SQL Light databases. Ooh, and it has like autocomplete and stuff. Ah, uh, we've always missed that. It's ah, uh, I want to just this one. It's so clear that I want to have this table. Uh, 
of course, this immediately makes me think, I want, whatever happened to pipe cut? I want, I want more pipe cut. Do you remember pipe yeah, cut? Yeah, what happened to David it? David Maxwell's thing? I'm, I'm pretty sure the problem is David Maxwell got busy. <laughs> yeah, we should, we should remind him the next time we see him. Well, you at least get it up on GitHub or something. Yeah, that would be great. That was last year's BSD can, right? No, it was Meet BSD like four years oh. ago. Oh, oh, okay. I thought you had an update since then. But was, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I, it possibly, I don't know. Uh, but we interviewed him for the podcast about it at Meet BSD when it was at Western Digital. Ah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that was before I went to that conference. Okay, yeah, yeah well. Where was the Meet BSD? Yeah, so that was four years ago because mm -hmm. two years later we did it at Berkeley and two years after that we did it at Intel. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Berkeley was my first one. Right, uh, so, so it was but two yeah. years before Berkeley. Hmm. And yeah, so they have right. quick start sections and installation instructions, so check it out. Yes, especially if you have to work with SQLite. Uh, next, in honor of Donald Knuth's 81st birthday, Stanford has released 111 of his lectures on YouTube. Hey, great. There so should have, be something. Uh, tech for beginners. Uh, adv advanced Techs Arcania. If you want to do <laughs> more stuff. The internal details of Tech82. And what else they got? Oh, great. I mean, we covered uh, Donald Knuth a couple of episodes ago uh, about uh, the he algorithms. He apparently does special Christmas lectures. Oh, cool. Uh, so they have 2016, 2017, 2018, a bunch of Christmas lectures. That's interesting. <laughs> now Lots I need to update times. my watch list. <laughs> uh, mathematical writing, computer aids to writing, and... Yeah, there should be some great material in there. Oh, yeah. Lots of stuff. It's probably not very... Well, it's a lecture. It should be understandable for people, but Here it's probably at a high level. Uh, Donald Knuth, fast input-output with many disks. <laughs> yes, <please. laughs> See? <laughs> I want more of that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, speaking about, I uh, want more of that. Uh, how about going to the Portland BSD Pizza Night on uh, January 31st, mm -hmm. 1900 hours at the Sweetheart Pizza? So they travel around a bit. Uh, yep, different to, pizza place every time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they are in the Sweetheart Pizza, uh, pizza place this time. And if you want to, um, yeah, just meet other BSD people uh, talking about BSDs over pizza. That's a great opportunity in the Portland, Oregon area. Good uh, way. And they do this for a couple of months now, so it's becoming a regular uh, thing. The, the Portland BSD Pizza Night has been going on for years. They just yeah, finally yeah. started inviting everybody. <laughs> yeah, we, we made the announcements a couple yes. <laughs> of episodes. Because uh, I know that's how we rediscovered Rod Grimes, is he just saw one of these on the local event site or whatever and showed up one time and we're like <laughs> he had a hunger he had a hunger oh, for how pizza are you? And... <laughs> yeah yeah perfect so you never know who shows up and who meets and uh, yeah the rest is history yeah. um, but if you're thinking wow Portland's really far away I live in Europe then check out the next ones here we have the BSD users Stockholm meetup number 5 will be Tuesday February 19th uh, at 6pm so that's 1800 uh, and it will be at uh, Magnus Ladeschusenslaschengarten. Uh, yeah, people would know where link. that is. <laughs> just type it into Google Maps if you're not from well, Sweden. There's a, there's a map on the page, so just go to the meetup ah, page perfect. and it'll be, it'll be <laughs> sorted. Uh, but check that out. Uh, but if you're not in uh, the Nordic countries, check out the... Eastern the, Europe? Uh, Polish BSD user group, which is having their meeting uh, January 25th. So that's this Friday. Uh, if you're watching this, it probably means it's tomorrow. Uh, and if you're watching it in Europe, it might mean it's tonight. Um, yes, uh, Nicholas points out that the Stockholm one is at a different place than usual, so make sure you pay attention. Um, anyway, BSD Poland uh, is January 25th at uh, 1815 to 2100. 
and it's back at the wheel systems offices. I think uh, last time they were at the university uh, for a special visit, but this time they're back at the wheel offices. Mm -hmm. And we don't try to pronounce their street name. You can find that. It's, it's <laughs> they have a nice tux, by the way, down there as a uh, word cloud. Uh, yeah. Not a tux. Beastie, of course. Beastie. <laughs> You're so bad. Ah, uh, uh, here we go. Uh, reminding you about Asia BSDCon 2019 call for papers. We cannot tell yes. you enough. It's one week. Next week's episode, you're already too late by the yep. time it comes out. So, go. Do now. Run. Don't Submit. Walk. Submit. <laughs> Don't say we didn't mention it. All right. Uh, time for feedback and questions. We get feedback and questions, but not enough. Uh, you should send everything that you want to know from us. Uh, questions about systems, about our favorite pizza toppings, whatever you want. Uh, send that to feedback at bsdnow.tv and we'll cover it in a future episode. Maybe not the toppings, um, but more BSD content. Um, the first one who did that is Greg. Uh, has a question about VLANs and jails goes like this. Hi, everyone. Uh, hi, everybody. Sorry. I'm in the process of upgrading my network, and I'd like to include jails into VLANs. Outside of BSD Box, I'll divide devices into logical groups and establish rules about how they are allowed to communicate with each other. I know how to make VLANs in my switch and apply it to my devices, but how interworkings uh, work in the BSDs with the IOCage jail? How do include the instance of a Nextcloud into VLAN 10 and the Plex IOCage jail into VLAN 20? Right. Uh, so mostly it depends on what types of jails they are. Uh, so first, what you want to do on the switch is pass those VLANs to FreeBSD, uh, to the physical machine, uh, tagged. And then on the FreeBSD, you create VLAN interfaces that are children of the main interface, and they will receive the tagged packets. So you can create, you know, uh, IGB0.10, and it will receive all the packets uh, destined for VLAN 10. And you know, IGB 0 0.20 for VLAN 20. Um, if you're doing regular jails, so not vimage jails, regular jails, then you just add the IP address you want the Plex jail to have to the IGB 0 0.20 interface. Uh, and it, if, the, if that IP address is on the VLAN 20 interface, it will only be in VLAN 20. Um, if they are vimage jails, then what you want to do is when you create the bridge that connects the ePair interface that the vimage jail is using to your physical interface is you would connect it to IGB 0 0.20 instead of just IGB 0. Um, I don't know how much IOCage helps you with that. I'm not an expert on IOCage. Um, but yes, uh, it's relatively straightforward to do. Um, I was actually discussing it on Twitter with Michael Lucas uh, just last night because he's working on FreeBSD Mastery Jails, including instructions on how to do this. Um, but ah, yes, I'm yeah, sure maybe they somebody from IOCage uh, hmm. can help you with that. Uh, yeah, sooner than having to wait for the book to come out. Yeah, there's definitely a community you can ask, and they are uh, helpful and could probably solve you uh, easily with that problem. Yeah, because. IOCage tries to do a bunch of stuff for you. I'm not sure exactly how you would approach setting up the VLAN. Hmm. Okay, maybe someone else knows. and we But can... it's definitely doable, and it's relatively straightforward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not uh, impossible, because it's meant to do things like that. Okay, thanks for that question. Uh, the next one is coming from Tara about ZFS on removable disks. Uh, goes like the following. Hi, I've never seen much on using ZFS with removable disks. As USB drives get larger and larger, the normal FAT file systems uh, to transfer data back and forth is getting difficult. I'd like to use ZFS on my portable USB drives, especially to transfer between various operating systems. My normal desktop is macOS, but I also use hardened BSD and Linux. Uh, I'm on the f uh, oh, I'm on my phone at the moment, so I don't have more details. But hopefully, you can help uh, lead us on the right direction. Uh, should it be as easy as zpool import and then zpool export and then on the next system zpool import and export again? Yes, that is the idea. Uh, the only thing you'd want to do is make sure that you create the pool so that it's compatible with all the systems and doesn't use any extra feature flags that aren't available everywhere yet. Um, but 
that's relatively straightforward. But yes, you just create the pool and you export it, plug it in a different machine, import it. Uh, I've done this a number of times. Um, half of my USB sticks are formatted ZFS because I don't trust the USB stick not to corrupt the data. <laughs> mm, so uh, you said, but also it's the easiest file format that works for me on my win on uh, all my machines except for Windows. And with the ZFS and Windows port getting almost to the point where I consider installing it on my computer, um, it may be the only truly universal file system. Yeah, and since Windows uh, port is also looking nice, uh, mm -hmm. apparently that should be the format in the future. So yeah, because good way Factory to start. Two can't do files over four gigabytes, I think. Um, that's and then there's limit. yeah, and then there's XFAT, but that's not actually well supported everywhere. Uh, yeah, I think my only FAT32 formatted USB stick is for my parents' old not so smart TV. Mm. Do you set any special options for the USB stick in the Zpool uh, settings? No, nope. nope, nothing special. Okay. Just yeah. Create it like you would a normal disk. Mm. Compression, of course. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, pretty straightforward. Just try it out. And yeah. it uh, works with whether it's like a USB hard drive where you have an actual external drive or just, you know, one of these. <laughs> yeah, this works great. Okay, and the last uh, question we got is from Casey about the interview we did with Kirk McCusick um, over Christmas. Well, the interview actually happened during BSD Can, but we uh, broadcast it uh, during that time. So uh, the question goes, do you think there is any chance we could someday have a UFS system with any of the features of ZFS, like at least checksums or snapshots? or a ZFS that has enough features stripped out to run well on embedded computers like RPI or low mem systems? Okay, uh, a couple different things. First, uh, UFS does have snapshots, but they're, you will find them to be not as nice as ZFS snapshots, but in general, they exist uh, as a feature. Now, because UFS isn't copy on write by default, once you create a snapshot, it will have performance impact and so on, as it will have to know not to overwrite the other stuff and so on. Um, checksums, um, they're slowly adding some checksums to UFS. I don't think you'll end up with full data checksums like ZFS, because in UFS, inodes, the data structure that knows about each uh, file, are statically allocated, usually at the beginning when you format the file system. Although I think there is a way to adjust the number of them uh, with TuneFS. But you'd have to have the slot to have the um, the checksum in that statically allocated one, uh, and it would limit how many files you could fit and so on. It would, uh, the UFS wasn't really designed for that. Although you could get some of the way there. Um, as far as ZFS with feature stripped out, um, there's not that many features that really need to be stripped out. Um, if your low memory system is actually 64-bit and can have a kernel address space that is large, even if it only actually has one gigabyte of memory, uh, it works better than uh, if you, for example, had 32-bit uh, hardware that can only actually address uh, some fraction of four gigabytes of memory. Uh, even i386 nowadays with FreeBSD, I think, does 12 have the 4-4 four, four split? I think so. I have not 13. Um, is a little easier on ZFS since there's 4 gigs of memory for the kernel and 4 gigs for user space uh, of address space rather than 3 gigs for user space and 1 gig for the kernel, uh, which was a problem for ZFS. Um, the biggest problem is the way ZFS works is it cannot remove stuff from the arc if it's in use. So if you're using files, uh, they take up memory uh, and you don't have very much to spare. And you know, the arc can't shrink down more than this. You can't evict stuff that's locked. Uh, and so it can get a little complicated with really low memory like that. Um, of course, you could turn most of the arc off, right? Yeah. Just by setting primary cache equals none. Uh, it would just be quite slow because you have your fragmented files written everywhere and no caching. 
Well, I have to say that I run the little ZFS uh, system that I have on my Raspberry Pi 3 just fine. Because mm-hmm. that's 64-bit. Yeah. Although that has 2 gigs of memory in the... Um, it's less than 4, I know. Yes. Um, oh, I can't connect from here. Um, yep. I, it, I don't need any special tuning. It's just not the beefy system that you would expect from right. a big server, but it works. It's not crashing. It's fine for the purpose it's uh, supposed to do. Yes. So, and there, there are lots of instances of people running uh, FreeBSD with ZFS in one and two gig VMs. Uh, it's just it, you can get into a little bit of trouble if you have too big of a working set. But again, um, if you just set primary cache equals none, uh, then ZFS won't really use much memory at all. Um, but yeah, it won't be very fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, use the yeah. file systems for the parts that they are used to. So UFS yeah. has its place and ZFS has its place and they shouldn't overlap too much. Well, they can. But, yeah. but uh, yeah, embedded should still be using UFS these days. All right, All that's, right, that's a wrap. Uh, it's about uh, time to end the show. And uh, we'll definitely have something for you next week as well. So thanks for watching this one and see you next week.